got you there with Sean Delaney. I'm Sean Delaney, and today on What Got You There, I sit down with author Dan Millman, whose book, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, had a profound impact on my life. Well, Dan actually has a new book out called Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit that uncovers so much of his journey, the mentors he's learned from, and how we can all bring our best selves to this world. Well, got you there with Sean Delaney. Well, got you there. Dan, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Great, Sean. Thank you for having me on your show. Oh, absolutely. This is so invigorating and exciting for me. Your work's had a tremendous impact on me, so it's really good to see you. But we're going to start off here with how you started off your most recent book. And I would love to know why you decided to choose this quote. And that quote is, may the stars guide you through the dark and speckled forest along widening, passionate paths. May you learn from your wandering. So you return both stronger and wiser here and now where you make your home. I would just love to know what resonates so deeply with you about that quote. That quote by uh, Agnieszka Rajak, I believe it is, um, just seemed indicative. It was a great opening quote for the journey, for the spiritual quest dark and winding paths, a speckled forest. Um, it just seemed appropriate for this quest that I believe everyone is on. Whether we would call it a spiritual quest or whether it's fully conscious or not, we're all seeking a sense of fulfillment, something deeper, um, not just the conventions of everyday life, because those who've achieved reasonable happiness in a relationship, uh, maybe finances or a career, they still, there's something they begin to ask, what am I here for uh, in those quiet moments? So I think that just seemed like a, a, a wonderful image. That's why I use that opening quote. Thank you for asking. Yeah, no, deeply resonated with me. Uh, so I really appreciate it. I was just curious to get your insights there. And, and one of the other things that I think spoke to me, you mentioned we're all seeking something. And, and then one of the things that, that you've talked about before is seeking excellence as opposed to seeking success, right? Like so many people seek success but we can't control success, but we can control excellence. And I would love just to know your thoughts around this and this approach you take to so many things, basically your entire life, which is what I love so much. Well, it, it's, it's a saying most of us have heard that, that happiness is getting, uh, or, or success is getting what you want. Happiness is wanting what you get. So it's, there's a bigger picture here, a learning to accept and embrace life as it unfolds, because it, Life comes at us in waves of change. We can't predict or control, but we can learn to surf. And so that is a kind of a spiritual or big picture skill we can develop that we weren't taught in, in school. Um, and that's really what the quest is about. And that's why I wanted to share my quest with a wider readership, not just because I presume that everyone cares about this Dan Millman character and wants to know all about his life, but because of the theme, uh, it it may shed light uh, or leave a trail of breadcrumbs in a sense uh, about the major elements of this quest for fulfillment and happiness. Yeah. For your approach to excellence, which, which leads to more happiness and fulfillment, when you, when you put your whole heart and soul behind right. something, right. I'm wondering for you, what, what does the practice of seeking excellence look like for Dan Millman today after such an incredible life and so many journeys? Right. I usually wander a bit, but I do get back to the question. Uh, sorry about that. Um, as far as success and excellence go, first of all, we can redefine success in, in, a, in a way that I find most practical, which is rather than reaching the top of the mountain uh, or our destination, rather, if we define success as making progress toward a meaningful goal, a goal meaningful to us, that is a form of success. And it, it seems much more uh, positive and useful because if we define the top of the mountain as success, then we fail with every step because we haven't reached the top yet. But if we define every step in the right direction, then uh, we succeed with every small step. We're making progress. We can pat ourselves on the back and remember that in perspective. But we, can con we can't control the outcomes. That's what you were suggesting. And that's what I write about in the book too. We can't control the outcomes in our life, but we can control our efforts. And by making a good effort, we increase the odds of getting um, the outcomes we would like. Uh, that's why I define effort as success, because every effort in the right direction. And we can control excellence. We can focus. We can bring the best we have at the moment to any task, whether it's in sports, as I did in my beginnings, in my youth. Um, 
but any task at all, we can uh, give our best shot. And that's what we can do. So we can aim for excellence, yes. But the idea of success is abstract. Yeah. And, and that's why I like to focus on the practical and the immediate. Yeah, that, that resonates deeply. Once again, uh, the, the word I think about often is arete. It's the Greek word. It essentially is like excellence, but excellence in your highest self each moment in that you can approach with that level of concentration, that effort and everything, I think is a beautiful way to go through life. I am wondering, you, you mentioned your gymnastics career, and this wasn't just uh, dabble into something. I mean, world champion, um, it, it's pretty unbelievable what you were able to accomplish there. And then obviously, as your journey has progressed, I am wondering for you, though, that approach, we have a lot of athletes who do listen to the show. And when they lose that game, it is very hard mentally to handle that. And I'm wondering what experience you have and how they could think about that, that practice towards excellence and not be so outcome focused. Well, one uh, suggestion I gave to the team I coached at Stanford University for four years, and we had the top U.S. Olympian and uh, developed a national team in about three and a half years from a high school level team when I arrived. Uh, and so my theories w worked pretty well in practice. Um, and one of the things I suggested was don't say I'm a gymnast. And in fact, for anybody, don't say I'm a doctor or an artist or a writer. Say I do gymnastics. I practice medicine. I work at art. Because that way, it's something we do. It's not a, a core element of our identity. Because when we have our identity wrapped up in something and how well we're doing, then if we don't do well that day, it, it seems to impact us as a human being. Am I failing as a human being? But really, it's just something we do. And we all know um, sometimes we do better than others. And that's what I want to make clear. When I say focus in the moment uh, and bring your best, Many people beat themselves up with that. They go, yeah, but I could bring more. I could do 100% in all that, um, that high energy, high achievement goal. But am I reaching my potential? And it's a little crazy making because by definition, we do the best we can every day of our life. It may not be on some absolute scale, but some days we have more energy than others. Some moments we do. So it's just a, a relaxed way of bringing ourselves into the moment. And, and there's a, a story I like to tell about uh, the man I called Socrates, my old literary mentor, for those who don't know my work. Um, we were in the gym one day, and I was uh, training on the high bar, and I, I, was, I did a routine, and then I did my dismount, a full twisting double somersault, whatever. But I stuck my landing, which is a good thing. Most people know that. And so I went, yes, you know, and, and then I decided it's a good time to wrap up workout for the night and then a high notes. So I ripped off my sweatshirt, threw it in my workout bag, and we were walking down the hallway afterward. And he, he said, Dan, you know, that last move you did uh, was really sloppy. And I went, what are you talking about, Socrates? I said, that was one of the best dismounts I've done in weeks. He said, oh, I'm not talking about the dismount. I'm talking about the way you took off your sweatshirt and put it in your bag. And he reminded me, once again, I was treating one moment as special and another moment as ordinary. And again, there are no ordinary moments. And when we start to value those in-between moments, not when we're in the gym or on the sports field or performing with a musical instrument uh, or, or giving a presentation, but every moment when we're walking to and from, when we're sitting down, standing up, because he followed up that comment about no ordinary moments with a reminder. I actually slipped into the movie script. I didn't write the script, but the movie based on my book, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, um, the director put, to his credit, put it in a couple of weeks before they started shooting. And the line that Nick Nolte uses, playing the old gas station attendant, he said, the difference between us, Dan, is you practice gymnastics. I practice everything. And I really had to think about that. Well, that sounds crazy. You practice everything. But what it means is most of us do things every day. We do the laundry. We do our work. We do our, our homework. We do whatever we do on the dishes. But when we turn our attention or our intention to practicing, can we do the dishes better than we did yesterday, more smoothly? Can we breathe or walk across a room better? How many of us are practicing our signature to see if we can sign smooth, more smoothly than we did last time? 
The moment we intend to practice something, we're doing it to refine or improve it. And what happens when we do that in that moment when we remember, I don't remember all the time and nobody does, but when we do remember, it brings us into that state of absorption, that zone, that flow. Um, and that's why the idea of practicing everything uh, is one of those key elements in this approach to living that I teach, I call the peaceful warrior's way. Yeah, that line, actually, it was funny preparing for this conversation. I just went through in some lines and quotes of yours that I saved throughout the years. And that one, like front and center, uh, for me, at least, I, I it was just so deeply impactful. So I'm so glad you brought that up right now. I mean, you've talked about in the past before that the ultimate school uh, is life and what it can teach us. And you say earth is a school and daily life is our classroom. And every moment has a lesson for us. Uh, I'm wondering for you along your own evolution, like when did this really start to become clear for you? I think it's when I realized, uh, when I heard that statement for the umpteenth time that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. But many of us misunderstand that, uh, as, as you know, Sean. Um, they think when, they're, when they've suffered enough or when they're deserving enough or when they've prepared uh, sufficiently, then some teacher like Socrates will appear to uh, guide them or kick them up the path. Um, but actually, what I think that statement means is when the student is ready, or paying attention, the, less, the teacher appears everywhere. Hmm. I, I, I tell the story in, in the book about a lesson, a valuable lesson I learned that changed my behavior, changed my breathing uh, from a cloud, watching a cloud just ride across the sky, so, or a tree bending in the wind. So we can learn when we're paying attention. And you know, Andre Gide uh, said, he said, everything that needs to be said has already been said, but it needs to be said again and again, because no one's really paying attention. So when we do pay attention, uh, that's when the lessons appear. And we can have an incident with someone, an emotional charge. It could be anything, a fender bender, somebody cuts in front of us, or, or something happens on the sidewalk or in our office or wherever it is, at home, in a relationship. And if we, we're paying attention, we can go, hmm. What can I learn from that? I think and, one of the things, oh, yeah. sorry, continue, please. No, please. No, right. I'm just thinking one of the things we, we tend to put people like yourself up on a pedestal. And I appreciate one of the things you said, like, we're not perfect. None of us are. And so I'm wondering for, for the people listening to someone like yourself, I mean, I look to as someone who just taught me so much up on that pedestal, what is life teaching you right now? Well, you may recall at the end of the book, I tell a story about mindfulness <laughs> you know, when, when uh, I was introduced at a talk I gave in Melbourne, Australia, they said, Dan Millman is an expert in mindfulness from America. And the first thing I said to the audience was, my wife might beg to differ <laughs> because she notices if I do the dishes, when they dry, spots show up. And she said, Dan, you missed this spot and this spot. And so I'm constantly learning. It's a, it's a continuously humbling endeavor. Um, and one of the themes as I repeat in the book numerous times, well, three or four times anyway, that every teacher is human and every human has foibles and failings. Mm -hmm. um, we expect a teacher either to be perfect in all ways or completely flawed and canceled. You know? But most teachers, including myself, I take the role of teacher today, I'm, I'm an elder now, um, but most teachers have their quirks and foibles. Fortunately, because I've got a wife who'll kick my butt if I don't do it right. Um, she's my guardian angel and North Star. We've been married 46 years now, best friends. Uh, and she will remind me if I have any slips. And fortunately, I haven't had any major slips you're going to read about in the newspaper <laughs> or anything like that. But quirks, sure. So we're all human. We're all doing the best we can each day. And in fact, we need to consider just the possibility that our parents did the best they could in raising us, whether they were kind and attentive and thoughtful, or whether they were even cruel and abusive. With their wounds, their blind spots, their suffering, they were doing the best they knew how. It may not have been very good, uh, and it doesn't make any excuses if, if there was a really poor upbringing, but it provides a partial explanation and understanding with compassion that we're all doing the best we can here. Sometimes it's better than other times. 
Yeah. It's always so helpful. We have a, a great joy like that in our lives to, to, to bring out our, our even better selves. It's, it's remarkable the amount of work that you've done over your career. Uh, Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, the 18th book. Uh, first of all, that's just an impressive, impressive body of work. It shows the commitment to your practice and your excellence. I'm wondering why that title specifically? Well, that's a very good question, I think, because um, let me just tell you the inception of the word peaceful warrior. Yeah. Um, I was, as, as I wrote in the book, um, I was teaching a martial arts course at Oberlin College when I was an assistant professor at Oberlin. Um, and it was focused on Aikido and Tai Chi. And they're both more internal arts. And I was going to call the course, it was a survey course to introduce students to these martial arts. Uh, I was going to call it Way of the Warrior which made a lot of sense, but it didn't quite fit since they're non-aggressive arts, they're more defensive arts. Um, So a light bulb went on and I went, hey, why don't I call it the way of the peaceful warrior? It kind of lent a balance. And it was only years later that I wrote the book that I thought, hey, that would be a good title, way of the peaceful warrior. Now, people have asked me, well, Dan, I wish I were a peaceful warrior like you, or I wish I could become one someday. And In my view, it's clear to me that everyone I see is a peaceful warrior in training, every human being. Some who are sociopathic, you know, extreme examples, uh, psychopathic, those souls may be lost for a while, but they're still in training. We're all here to learn. But for you and me and most people, um, we're all striving to live with a peaceful heart, a sense of equanimity, serenity in the midst of the chaos of everyday life and change. And at the same time, we recognize there are times we need a warrior's spirit. So the idea of peaceful heart, warrior spirit, it conveys male, female, young or old, for anyone, that we're all peaceful warriors in training in the school of daily life. And that's why that, you know, I looked for titles. For every book, it's been a real story of how you came up, I came up with a title. Um, but for this one, it came fairly naturally. I tried a few different titles, Stumbling Toward the Light, you know, that would have been a pretty good one. Um, but then Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, the story of my, the true story of my spiritual quest describes my life, but also I hope it appeals to many people who can relate to that idea. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And in the book, you, you describe the, the relationship and learnings amongst four mentors, which I would love to get into here in a second. But, but I am wondering, I mean, we can learn so much from, from mentors and then even from great books like, like yours and then other lessons. But I'm wondering, what are those lessons that no one can teach us? We just have to experience them. Are there any like that that just come to mind for you? Well, there's an ancient saying, I hear and I forget. <laughs> I see and I remember. I do and I understand. So yes, I agree with you, Sean, there are things that only experience can teach us. Uh, some, some cynical wag once said, the only people who profit from the experience of others are biographers. <laughs> but I don't think that's true. I think we actually can, we're connected, we're all connected. And by reading about other people uh, and, and seeing their lives and, and having them share their experiences, I think we can all learn. And one day it struck me that, you know, I was really into self-improvement. I described that some in the book, in my youth, um, memory courses and speed reading and learning to juggle and sleight of hand, uh, doing some magic and ventriloquism and bull whips and throwing boomerangs and yo-yos. And I try, I love to learn. And so I was constantly improving myself. But then one day it just struck me. I almost burned out on self-improvement. I said, you know, no matter how much I improve myself, only one person benefits. Mm. But if I could somehow influence the lives of other people, I didn't know how yet. Uh, Maybe it was through gymnastics, you know, somehow. But then it made my life more meaningful if I could impact other lives. Not everybody's called to that, but I was called to teach, to reach out and try to influence other people. And that's been my my career and calling for four decades now. Um, And I think because of that commitment to share what I learned, not just learn it for myself, but to share it with others somehow, um, I think that's what opened me up to meet these particular four mentors. 
you know, as you point out, we've all had role models and inspirations, teachers, maybe a couple of teachers stand out in our mind or memory from school uh, or in everyday life. We've all had those role models, but I was given somehow, I stumbled across one after the next over a 20 year period for significant mentors who each represent a different aspect of the spiritual path. Yeah, and those four being the professor, the guru, the warrior priest, and the sage. And you do such a good job getting into a lot of the lessons that, that you learned through them in the book. But I would love, could you even just give a, a flyover on each one of them? Just give the, the listeners kind of a, a heads up and preview into, into what they can expect out of each one of those? Sure, just an overview. Well, the professor created a school. That's why I call him the professor. I could have called him the headmaster, but he created a, a school like no other on the planet because of his unusual background. Uh, and it had a, an incredible blend uh, to amplify and accelerate our evolution. And first he promised at the end of a 40 day intensive training, 10 hours a day, uh, doing 30 or 40 different kinds of meditations for different purposes, various breathing exercises, uh, of retention, and including kundalini type things, um, uh, deep body work, a bone massage I described in Way of the Peaceful Warrior, uh, the Mongolian warriors used to do before and after battle to clear fear-produced tension from the body, movement disciplines, psychophysical kind of movement disciplines, models of understanding, uh, levels of consciousness, how we reduce tension in our, in our lives uh, and respond to stress. Um, so it was, and, and we did a lot of group work as well and insight work. Anybody who has heard of the Enneagram books for self-knowledge, actually all that came from the professor. His actual name was Oscar Ichazo. And of course, these are real people. I mean, I do give their names and so on, but their archetypes are very significant. So that was one approach to spiritual life. He said, at the end of the 40 days, you will be enlightened. Well, we'd learned a lot. I, I could speak for myself. It really transformed my body, my mind, clarity, expanded awareness. Was I enlightened? Not classically. So then there was an advanced training. And then there was another, more work after that. And more. I ended up, moving on and discovering the guru. And the guru works differently. He said, I'd rather beat you with a stick than tell you to meditate your way to enlightenment. So he was an unconventional teacher. He was an American born teacher, went to Columbia and Stanford University. Uh, and he was a tremendous communicator and writer of many books. Um, so the guru though, the way he worked was he uh, uh, claimed very clearly and seemed to have the mojo and the creds to back it up. Uh, Alan Watts lauded him. So did Ken Wilber. Maybe you've heard of them. Um, both respected scholars and pundits um, and authors. So he worked with people in the sense of transmitting a transcendent or divine reality through his person. Uh, he was transparent to God or there's, it's hard to find words. Um, some people don't like the term God if they're not religious. I'm not particularly religious. But the divine, let's say, or a transcendent understanding, illumination, just being around him. And he sat with us in satsang, it's called, in the Hindu tradition. Uh, he wasn't Indian, though. He was an American-born fellow. So anyway, that was a very different way of working with people. Now, People think cult. When they think of guru, they go, oh, it must have been a cult. And in fact, the guru himself said, you know, this isn't a cult because it's difficult to get into and it's easy to get out of. <laughs> and that was true. He also pointed out that there are cults everywhere. There are cults around movie stars, singers, um, yeah, spiritual teachers as well. He said, the question is not whether something's a cult. It's whether it's benign or whether it's manipulative and controlling. So the word cult isn't necessarily a bad one. I mean, there are people who, you know, love various uh, chess cults and all kinds of, of uh, different approaches, people surrounding an idea who love it. So I was with him on and off almost seven years. Now, Joy, my wife, Joy, was also with me through the four mentors. And she actually, uh, around the seventh draft of the book, she read every draft as I was writing. 
Um, she said, Dan, I, I see this a little bit differently from you. Maybe I could write something too. And I went, that's a great idea. So she has commentaries about a total of about 10 pages sprinkled throughout the latter part of the book um, in the 200 page book, which I actually pruned down from 500 page bloated <laughs> overwritten first draft. Um, that was the challenge to turn it into a bonsai. Yeah, that might have been. Just, that must have been quite a process there. <laughs> it it was with each draft, I cut more and trimmed more and streamlined it. Jack London once said, "It takes hard writing to make easy reading," and that's always been my goal. I hope <laughs> I've succeeded in that. So that's that's the guru, the warrior priest. And again, I eventually, after seven to eight years, Joy and I moved on. That's when I met the warrior priest. Very different experience. I'd already had two of the heaviest hitting teachers I could have imagined. Um, so I wasn't interested in any more teachers. I wasn't go out there seeking another teacher. But a phone call came in one night, as I described, and I ended up meeting this fellow who, first of all, I had a relationship with him where the guru and the professor were distant figures, more or less. Uh, I didn't have a personal relationship, but he and I traveled together. We even talked together some. By this time, I was starting to teach. So he was an adventurer, martial artist, former bounty hunter. I mean, he was a really uh, Alaskan bush pilot, um, EMT, uh, but also a healer and metaphysician. He taught things like absent healing and, and uh, um, how to uh, avoid possession and these metaphysical ideas that were speculative, that couldn't be proven or disproven. But I was more interested in his practical information. And he really gave me my calling. He taught me the life purpose material that, that fe I was featured in one of my better selling books called The Life You Were Born to Live. Um, he also, uh, at the advanced training uh, with him, uh, we learned a, a way to teach knife fighting for spiritual growth. Yeah, I called it the Peaceful Warrior Courage Training. I taught it for 14 years. And people came from all over the world. And in learning to train with a knife, because that gets people's attention. And these are people who walked off the street. Most of them had never done any martial arts, although we had a couple of advanced third, fourth, fifth, sixth degree black belts also joining the course, because they were curious how we got the outcomes we did in four days in terms of being able to move without thinking, and in, in terms of the fundamental shifts people made that they remembered and felt for decades after. So, by the way, this isn't a promotional comment. I don't teach it anymore. Yeah. It was just very labor intensive. I had a staff and everything. But it was a wonderful training at the time, and I learned that from the warrior priest. Uh, he taught race car driving, um, all kinds of adventurous things. So that was a very different flavor. He also taught self-trust. That's where I got the phrase, uh, I'm not here for you to trust me. I'm here to help you trust yourself. Mm -hmm. And so in the guru's community, self-trust was a rare commodity. It was all about trusting the guru. You know, he pointed out, the guru pointed out something I thought was very valuable. He said there are three fundamental approaches to spiritual life, to the quest. He said they correspond to three phases of human life, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood, those transitional phases. He said, in our childhood, we search for a parent figure, a great parent, who to tell us what to do, to project on that person all our power and wisdom, and to obey them and submit to them. That's what children need to do to survive with parents. They learn from their parents, and that's an appropriate place in the childhood of our lives and our spiritual search. So there's nothing wrong with that, but we eventually need to grow out of childhood and we become adolescents. Now, what is adolescence characterized by? As we all know, we reject authority. We say, all oh, these guys are charlatans. They're fakes. They don't know anything. Never trust them. Only I know what's best for me. Know-it-all, the know-it-all stage of the 20-somethings who are bulletproof and so on. And we all go through that phase, ultra confident in many ways. Um, so, but, it, but they tend to reject and, and really ignore and deny uh, our wisdom out there. But eventually some of us reach maturity or adulthood when we find wisdom wherever we can in odd places, even an old service station maybe. 
<laughs> but we find wisdom where it appears, we start paying attention. And those are the phases we go through. And I, I sort of recognize myself in different uh, phases of my own journey, my own search. So he really was a wise teacher. Now, many gurus um, encourage that childlike devotion to them. But this guru said, before you can become spiritual, you have to become fully human. He was looking for mature humans to, to uh, lift, not neurotic people who needed a, a parent. So he was constantly criticizing us in that way. So it wasn't a place to learn self-trust. And, I, and, and the, the warrior priest, the third of my teachers, really gave me a, more of a sense of that as I described in various incidents in the book. And finally, though, through various circumstances, uh, I found the sage near the end of my journey uh, of the, for these four mentors. And the sage brought me back down to earth simple reminders about reality that after dealing with all the metaphysics and the sky of mind and the abstract ideas, I came back to, it was like meeting a Zen master, you know, uh, just here and now. And he pointed out what we can and cannot control. And many of us, many of us have grown up in a psychological culture and we assume that inner work and spiritual practices are necessarily Eastern. Uh, we've grown disillusioned with a Western solution to happiness. So we look to the Eastern solution rather than the expansive extroverted approach, unleash your power and succeed and win at the game of life. Instead, it's all our answers lie within. Sit, meditate, contemplate, uh, and go on the inner journey. And that's an endless adventure as well. But the sage, it was more about... Uh, both, embracing the best of both, uh, but noticing what we can and cannot control. And what I was leading up to a few moments ago, we don't necessarily have to fix our minds and only have positive thoughts or quiet the mind or have just the right emotions like courage and confidence and love and peace so we can finally live wisely and well. He pointed out what really matters is what we do moment to moment. What do I need to do now? And many people get that, but not exactly. I know I didn't at first because I've been conditioned so much the other way. It was like deep programming in a way to come back to the peace of everyday reality each moment. I'm wondering, could you even go a little bit further then for people to hear that and it's, it's abstract for them? Uh, I'm wondering, could we even go a level deeper there? Sure. Sure. Ah, but going deeper is, again, I, I've found this in my own experience, a challenge. It has to do with what we can and can't control. Now, there are many books written and seminars that will teach you mind control, supposedly, or how about anger management? You know, anger management courses don't teach us to control anger. We can't control anger or fear or sorrow. Emotions pass through us like the weather. Um, they come and they change, and then a new emotion comes. If we really pay attention, have our watch beep every 20 minutes and write down what we're feeling, our feelings change all the time. A little excited, a little bored, a little sad. All these things pass through us moment to moment. We can't just will ourselves to feel differently than we do in any given moment, but it passes anyway. There are many techniques that we do to try to influence how we feel, like method actors try to influence to bring a genuine performance into the film or play or whatever. Um, so there are a lot of techniques to try to influence, but as far as control by our will, we can't control our emotions. We can't control our thoughts, our discursive thoughts, the ones that just pop up into our mind. Sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're negative. But we don't have a spam filter in our head. We don't say, I think I'll think this thought next. Thoughts come and thoughts go. So rather than trying to control what we really don't have any direct control over, the one thing we have our arms and our legs and our mouth. That's an action. Moving the mouth, making noise. It's called talking or singing. We can control that. Now, some people say, I didn't mean to say that. 
Yeah, they did. They may have regretted it later, but nobody took possession of their mouth. That's the, the point is a problem with many young people, teenagers or late teens or adults, is we take too much responsibility for what we're thinking or feeling and not enough responsibility for what we actually have control over, which is what we do. So that's why the sage said, let's focus more on what we can control. And he advised three things. He said, to live wisely and well, accept your thoughts and feelings. Accept them as natural to you in that moment. By accepting, it's like you would in meditation. You notice them. You don't deny them or ignore them or fear them or run from them. Just accept them. Okay, this is what I'm feeling now. This is what I'm thinking. It's positive. It's negative. Whatever. But at the same time, the second thing is, what is my purpose? What is my aim or goal right now? What do I need to do? And then doing it. That's the third thing. Doing what we need to do in line with our goal or purpose. Not in line with Dan Millman's philosophy or what we read in the holy book, but in line with our purpose. And so that was part of his teaching, but there was more to it I won't go into right now because. No, that, that, it's incredibly helpful though. I am wondering, I know a lot of people are very curious, all, all of this year's wisdom and practices, what are you doing currently? Both I'm wondering meditatively and then also even with breathing. I know it's been a major practice for you. Well, currently I'm, I'm speaking with you. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we always know our purpose in this moment. We may not know our cosmic purpose or 10 weeks from now what my purpose will be, but right now I know my purpose and that's what I'm doing. Now, if you mean in general daily yep. life, um, I get up and I exercise. The first thing my wife and I both do, we, as soon as we get out of bed, uh, and, and I don't want to get into it now, but I actually developed a set of bed exercises that are actually really good for waking up in the morning. They get almost every muscle group, the, the whole core, the glutes, the quads, before I even get out of bed. And, and I don't even have disturb my wife. Uh, it's very quiet and, and easy to do, but it's a great way to start the day. Uh, and I focus on breathing, all the things I do. Um, uh, so I, I do exercises every morning. Uh, what did I do this morning? This morning I did our elliptical machine, but usually I walk around Bro Brooklyn's Prospect Park uh, or bike around it, uh, all weather pretty much. Uh, so that's how I start the day. And then finally we come in, shower and, um, and have breakfast and then go about my day. We all have different things we need to do, whether we're students, parents, uh, we can't all have that luxury, but that's why I created a four minute workout, the peaceful warrior workout, which I've been doing. It's a core part of my workout, uh, that I do, uh, probably I've done it for almost 40 years now. Mm -hmm. Hard to imagine, but yeah, almost 40 years every day a four minute workout and I do more, but that's a core. When I'm on the road, I always do that every morning in my hotel room, whatever. So I like to keep things efficient, even for busy parents. Uh, they can fit in four minutes. And I, I just, I also created a four minute meditation. I, I need to emphasize just for a moment for clarity. I didn't study with four mentors and then go about parroting their words. Some of their wisdom that did, does come through that I hung on to, that is a way to communicate simply and directly. Um, but what they did was they opened doors within me to express my own teaching um, and, and speak with my own authority. So, uh, because I can't possibly teach the whole training that the professor taught me, um, that, that's appropriate within that school. I don't serve as a guru who transmits the divine you know, through sitting with people. I don't function that way. Um, nor am I quite as adventurous as the warrior priest was, he, uh, just an amazing charismatic guy. But I do what I do. You know, someone once said, I cannot write a book commensurate to Shakespeare, but I can write a book by me. And that's what I've been striving to do all these years. When did you get comfortable enough that this was your journey? and not someone else's to be lived. Because I think one of the things that I see often is so many people feel the need to feel like they need to live someone else's life. Well, we've all heard the sayings, uh, be yourself because everybody else is already taken. Um, I mean, there are different ways to put that. Um, but one of my mission directives, one of the, the fundamental principles of this approach to living, I call the peaceful warrior's way, 
is that there is no best teacher, no best philosophy, religion, book. Um, there's only the best for each of us at a given time of our life. So it's important for us to respect life is an experiment. We have to find out what works for us. So what, what I focus on um, is I've ceased comparing myself to anyone else. And I recommend the same for anyone. Because as soon as we compare ourselves to someone else, we're either going to feel superior or inferior. Mm -hmm. It's a profound disrespect for our own process, our own way. Well, let me, let me put it this way. When I was a coach uh, and I, I taught beginning gymnastics classes, which were a blast. Um, and some people learn to somersault faster than other people. There are always those who learn things faster. But yet I noticed that those who took longer to learn the somersault often learned it better than those who learned it faster. So we have to respect our own way of living and learning. And I've had to do the same myself. So I'm, I'm comfortable in my own skin. Um, I have my strengths and liabilities. You know, one of the things that have carried me, uh, that carried through all the mentors is an increasing level of self-knowledge. Not just seeing my self-image, which many of us do, but actually meeting my shadow. At the opening of the book, under key terms, uh, um, I define enlightenment as a realization, a practice. And I have a quote by Carl Jung, the noted psychoanalyst. He said, enlightenment consists not just in the seeing of luminous shapes and visions, but in making the darkness visible. He added, though, the latter procedure is more difficult and therefore unpopular. But if we're willing to look at ourselves and see ourselves realistically, something the sage was very helpful in, it humanizes us. Uh, so I've come to know myself and make wiser decisions because of that. You see, if we don't really know ourselves, we make the right decision for the wrong person, the one we thought we were. That happens to many people in relationships when they're young or in the work choices when they're just starting out. They learn more about themselves. What are my talents? What are my values? What are my interests? And then they start making decisions that actually suit them. Of us can bring a, a peaceful heart and a warrior spirit, which is the, the title of the 18th book. Anything else you want to leave the listeners with? Of course, we're going to have links to, to where you can purchase the book, but any final words on the book and, and what you hope the listeners bring with them from it? Well, when people hear the term 18 books, they figure I just knocked out 18 books. Well, it took me 40 years and every book had to justify itself and every one is on a different topic. But this is the true story. It's my culminating work. I don't see any more books in my future. I'll continue to teach where I'm invited. But this book is special uh, because it is the culminating work looking back on everything. And I think many people may relate to it. And that's my hope. Initial letters, I've received emails from friends who've read the book. Uh, I found it quite encouraging. Yeah. Well, Dan, I can't thank you enough for joining us here on What Got You There. And let me add, if anybody wants to, if they're curious about my work, they can always pop in to peacefulwarrior.com. Fantastic. Thanks again. Thank you, Sean. There with Sean Delaney. Got to there. And I want to thank you for watching another powerful episode of the What Got You There podcast. We drop new episodes every single Sunday. So if you subscribe to the page, you'll be the first one to see these powerful episodes. Remember, we deconstruct world-class performers to understand their strategy, tactics, and the routines they've used to help them become world-class in what they do. So if you want to understand and then implement these into your own life, you're going to want to subscribe to the page. Remember, we also put out a weekly newsletter called Momentum Monday, which is just a quick synthesis of everything I've been reading, listening to, and watching behind the scenes. You can stay up to date and follow everything we're doing at whatgotyouthere.com.